Pilot mute. Ja, es ist nicht so lang, es sind ein paar Minuten. Also ja. It's not.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Welcome to Switzerland. Welcome to Bern. My function right now is that of introducing our first speaker, who is our host for this evening. He is the rector of the University of Bern, Professor Christian Leumann. Thank you for being with us. Cher Monsieur le Conseiller Fédéral Guy Parmelin, dear President of the ALEA and the Swiss Academies, Antonio Loprieno, dear Director General for Research and Innovation of the European Commission, Jean-Éric Paquet, dear President of the European Research Council, Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, dear President of the Compagnia di San Paolo, Francesco Profumo, Dear Secretary General of the Guild, Jan Palmowski, dear Laureate of today's prize, Mariana Mazzucato, dear colleagues of the scientific community, dear members of the parliament and executive bodies, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to welcome all of you today for the celebration of the 25th anniversary of ALEA, the European Federation of Academies of Sciences and Humanities, representing 60 academies from 40 European countries. The academies have a long-standing tradition. The first academies in European history evolved already in the 15th century as a counterpoint against contemporary political and ecclesi ecclesiastical power. Their focus was engaging in the dialogue between science and society, highlighting the importance of fact-based knowledge and education. In current times where fake news and fake facts are distributed in an uncontrolled way, one realizes that the academies have certainly not lost their reason to exist. In contrary, we need them more than ever to carry along the virtue of science. Today, their challenge also includes to mediate between policymakers and the scientific community, which is important for the finding of common solutions to pressing societal problems. They're accompanied by university associations, such as the Guild, a network of European research intensive universities of which the University of Bern is a member. The academies continue to be important advocates for science policy, addressing important questions such as scientific integrity or open access or others, but also for identifying key research areas of our time as for example, climate change, just look out of the window, or biodiversity loss, as you may have seen recently in the news, uh, a theme of high actuality these days. Today's celebration is hosted by the Swiss Academies of Arts and Sciences, member of ALEA since many years, together with their sub-organizations, namely the Swiss Academy of Sciences, the Swiss Academy of Humanities and Social Sciences, the Swiss Academy of Medical Sciences, and the Swiss Academy of Engineering Sciences. We are happy to host this meeting here in Bern at the seat of the University of Bern, but who is actually the University of Bern? Just in a nutshell, we are a comprehensive university uh, harboring or being home in these days for about 18,000 students. We are composed of eight faculties and nine strategic research centers, focusing on excellence in research and teaching with emphasis on inter and transdisciplinary approaches. Our university places high value on five thematic areas, namely health and medicine, matter and universe, sustainability, 
intercultural knowledge and politics and administration, the latter, of course, touches upon the fact that we are located in the capital of Switzerland. The University of Bern, just to give you one example, has a strong and long-standing tradition in space science. Some of you may know that it was here in Bern where the solar wind composition experiment was designed, which was sent to the moon on board of the Apollo 11 mission exactly 50 years ago in 1968. This solar wind sail was enrolled on the moon by Buzz Aldrin even before the US flag, a fact that still makes us proud and which is one of the reasons why we are celebrating this year's the 50th anniversary of the moon landing to which I warmly invite all of you. In the era of sustainability, we help to make the earth a better place to live with our well-known climate science and also with our Center for Development and Environment, where we focus on questions of land use. Making the world a better place to live is also one of the aims of the academies by promoting an open dialogue between science, politics, and society. I'm going to stop with this, and I would like to thank all of you and all partners of the ALEA General Assembly and the Swiss Academies to have chosen Bern as the starting place for uh, their continuous work, uh, specifically uh, of this week's General Assembly. And I would like now to hand over to uh, our Mr. Federal Councillor Guy Parmelin, who is going to address also a few words on the General Assembly here. Thank you very much for your attention. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Directeur Général, Mesdames et Messieurs, Les invités en vos titres et fonctions académiques, ladies and gentlemen, j'ai le grand plaisir, au nom du gouvernement suisse, de vous souhaiter à toutes et à tous la bienvenue dans notre pays. C'est un très grand honneur pour le Conseil fédéral que vous ayez choisi d'organiser en Suisse votre 25e anniversaire, événement pour lequel je vous félicite très chaleureusement et vous adresse mes voeux les meilleurs. Un quart de siècle, selon le contexte, peut paraître ou apparaître comme une période somme toute assez brève. Cependant, les 25 dernières années se sont avérées à l'échelle mondiale d'une densité inédite, tant elles ont entraîné de profonds changements dans nos sociétés. Je pense en particulier à l'ouverture de l'Europe, à une nouvelle constellation des forces sur le plan international, aux effets d'une globalisation galopante, à ceux de la digitalisation, aux changements climatiques, aux modifications de notre système de valeurs ou encore à la migration. L'ensemble de ces facteurs suscite parmi les gens dans notre société et dans l'économie non seulement des interrogations, mais encore, il faut bien le dire, un sentiment d'insécurité. Dans ce contexte, les milieux académiques se voient donc investis de tâches importantes. Contribuer à apporter, apporter les connaissances fondamentales à la compréhension du public, fournir des outils permettant de relever les défis les plus urgents, donner des impulsions scientifiques. À cela s'ajoute un élément déterminant à mes yeux, dans un monde où la polarisation et la tendance au discrédit, vous avez parlé de fake news, monsieur le recteur, et euh, la tendance au discrédit vont croissant, les hautes écoles, en tant qu'institutions scientifiques indépendantes, continuent de servir de phare et continuent à donner les bonnes orientations. Et à ce titre, je vous remercie toutes et tous d'être au service de cette importante cause. Nous comptons sur vous pour être à l'avenir également des bâtisseurs de ponts entre la science et la société et nous nous en remettons avec confiance à votre expertise. Une université 
met l'accent sur son indépendance, sur son ouverture et sur les échanges. Ce sont là des valeurs capitales qui sont d'ailleurs d'une importance équivalente pour notre pays. En effet, les échanges culturels, professionnels, scientifiques entre la Suisse et l'Europe reposent sur une tradition séculaire. Souvenons-nous à cet égard que des savants tels que Paracels, Jacques Bernoulli, Leonhard Heuler, Albrecht von Haller et Horace Bénédicte de Saussure ont tissé de nombreux liens avec les autres érudites et les académies de leur temps, jetant ainsi les bases d'une tradition que j'évoquais à l'instant. Jadis, les artisans étaient eux aussi souvent sur les routes à chercher des contacts susceptibles d'enrichir leurs propres connaissances techniques. Les années, les années d'apprentissage et d'itinérance constituaient ainsi les prémices d'une formation enrichie par les bienfaits de la réciprocité. La Suisse est aujourd'hui, à l'instar d'ailleurs d'autres, des autres pays européens, le maillon d'un réseau finement harmonisé en matière de formation, de recherche, d'innovation. J'en veux pour preuve les intenses relations qu'entretiennent à tout niveau et dans toutes sortes d'organes les académies suisses des sciences. J'inclus également dans ce vaste réseau les organisations internationales de recherche parmi lesquelles le CERN établi à Genève. Les échanges scientifiques profitent grandement des programmes internationaux de collaboration. Je songe ici au programme cadre européen pour la recherche et l'innovation, à l'ESA, l'Agence spatiale européenne, ou encore à des initiatives de soutien à l'innovation et à la technologie comme Eureka. La Suisse perpétue, elle aussi, cette tradition de l'échange et de la coopération. Elle partage ainsi avec plaisir ses connaissances au service de la recherche sa compétence s'agissant des transferts de technologie et son expérience en matière de formation duale. Mesdames et messieurs, l'échange scientifique et culturel n'est pas désincarné. Au contraire, il se nourrit sans conteste du rayonnement de ses représentants les plus marquants, des femmes et des hommes qui, avec cœur et conviction, s'engagent pour étoffer et faire circuler les savoirs. L'un des exemples les plus éclatants de cette, de cette vocation fut Germaine de Stahl, qui a donné son nom au prix que vous remettez aujourd'hui. Plutôt que de mener une existence discrète et sans saveur, Madame de Stahl a au contraire choisi de marquer de son empreinte la vie politique et culturelle française de la fin du XVIIIe siècle. La Genevoise s'est bâtie une renommée européenne grâce au succès de ses œuvres, à la diffusion de ses idées, à la force de son caractère et à ses achèvements personnels. Compte tenu de sa contribution au savoir de son temps, c'est pour moi un honneur tout particulier que de pouvoir remettre aujourd'hui le prix éponyme. Mais je ne voudrais pas terminer mes propos sans remercier les académies suisses de sciences, des sciences et tous les maîtres d'œuvre concernés pour la parfaite organisation de l'événement qui nous réunit. Je me réjouis de passer une partie de cette soirée en votre compagnie. Je vous souhaite à toutes et à tous de profitables échanges à la faveur de cet anniversaire et un agréable séjour dans notre pays. Longue vie et plein succès aux All European Academies dans la poursuite de leur mission au profit du développement de nos sociétés. Merci de votre attention et encore bonne soirée à toutes et à tous. Monsieur le conseiller fédéral Parmelin, Magnificence, lieber Christian, Monsieur le directeur général Paquet, Monsieur le président Bourguignon, Egregio Presidente Profumo, and especially dear Professor Mazzucato, dear delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is a distinct privilege to be able to welcome you all to this evening of memory and innovation. Memory of 25 years of our network of the major European academies of science and of innovation 
in view of the scientific achievements of this year's Madame de Stahl laureate. This celebration takes place at the end of the day of work that we devoted to our General Assembly, which is held once a year in one of the members' academies. And it is perhaps telling, as we were reminded by Federal Councillor Parmela, that the occasion of our jubilee, we are meeting in Bern as the seat of the Swiss Academies of Sciences. Academies in the plural, because in my country, everything, including scientific organizations, comes in many shapes and forms. We call it federalism, which, as again, Federal Councillor Pamela reminded us, displays very many competitive advantages in terms of what today's laureate would call the entrepreneurial state, but also here and there some minor organizational drawbacks when it comes, for example, to change management. It is telling that this year's meeting takes place in the capital of a country that combines tradition and memory, as we just heard in the introductory music, and globalism with innovation. Memory and innovation are in fact two poles of a continuum within which our European science landscape and our European academies operate. For it is emotional memory rather than chronological history that prompts a jubilee celebration, such as the one we are having tonight. Alea emerged 25 years ago in the wake of the profound political change, changes that were taking place in Europe after 1989 and at the end of the era of partition between East and West. Science became more globally interconnected and international collaboration among European academies more feasible and indeed necessary. For European academies, ALEA represented to a certain extent a response to the same institutional pre pressures that on the side of European universities prompted the Bologna reform. But with a fundamental difference, unlike universities, academies had been for centuries centers of scientific excellence, yet mostly within a national, often local perspective, with little attention devoted to international cooperation. The vision of our founding fathers was inspired by the same desire underlying the creation of the European higher education area, that is the foundation of a cohesive European community of scientists and scholars able to compete with the academic achievements of other powerhouses at world level, such as the US or we should even say now China. To lay uh, the foundation of this process, the first conferences were organized in 1990 by the Royal Dutch Academy and in 1992 by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, which paved the way for the creation of a pan-European organization of all academies, which is what ALEA stands for. Uh, ALEA itself was founded then at a meeting at the Académie des Sciences in Paris in 1994. Today, our network resides in Berlin, one of the most active research hubs in Europe, although, of course, most of our activity in science advice takes place in Brussels. For it is fair to state that ALEA's scope has expanded drastically in recent years to include precisely providing science advice for the European Commission. This takes place under the umbrella of a science advice mechanism in which the academies, through a joint program called SAPEA, work together with the European Union's chief scientific advisors to produce reports on science policy issues, such as retrieving food from the oceans or designing a common European policy on data governance. Here, I would like to honor 
the presence among us of Director General of Research, Jean-Éric Paquet, as the person responsible for running the scientific advice mechanism. Thank you very much for the trust you placed and Brussels placed in the academies. Based, I may say so, on the quality of the SAPEA report so far, I think that the European Commission was right to trust the academies. But that is, of course, something that it's on your side to decide. What is unique about our organization is that while our members are all European academies that have the prerequisites in terms of scientific output and critical mass to join the network, the specific nature of each academy varies very much depending on the respective country's scientific system. Some of us, of us such as the British academies in general, are learned societies with a history sometimes going back to the 17th century, Rector Leumann reminded this. Some, such as the Austrian Academy, are themselves research institutions acting de facto as mini or maxi universities. What unites, however, all these forms of academic life is the continuous quest for excellence in science in the interest of the common good. And it is precisely at the interface of scientific interest and societal benefit that we see the Academy's unique selling point in the current scientific landscape at the European and indeed at the global level. Universities produce new knowledge and convey it to young generations. Funding agencies support an increasingly expensive research and this is why I particularly honor the presence of the president of what we all agree is probably the foremost of our funding agency, the European Research Council. Thank you very much, President Bourguignon, for being with us. Uh, mainly conducted by young generations of scientists and scholars, because those of us who are scientists and scholars but who don't deserve the predicate young anymore, know that the actual research is rather being performed by our assistants in our labs or our uh, assistant professors at universities and not really uh, in many cases by those of us who are advanced in their career and at their age. Academies specialize in precisely in securing the interface between academia and the knowledge societies in which academia is embedded. So, to a certain extent, the widespread loss of trust in science and expertise that we were reminded of, if it really exists, which I personally doubt, convinced as I am that the disaffection we observe around us concerns rather the societal organization of expertise the so-called elites, then the object or the results of scientific investigation itself, if this loss of trust in scientific evidence truly exists, then it is indeed our own fault, more perhaps our own fault as academies, more than the universities or the funding agencies' fault, because it displays a fact that we should also perhaps recognize that we as academies have so far performed a less good job than we had in mind in what should actually be our core business. This means, this is actually good news, it means there's a lot of work ahead of us. Let us show Europe that we can provide a similar intellectual leadership at the crossroads of science and society as was the case in the 17th century with the Royal Society, the Leopoldina Academy, or the Academia dei Lincei. Today, on, uh, during our business meeting, we, as ALEA, launched a new strategy, and, as is usually the case in our marketing-conscious world, also a new logo for ALEA. The main foci of our activity in the next years will be continuing to serve 
the academies and facilitating the cooperation among them to improve the framework conditions for science and research at the European level, providing independent scientific advice to policymakers and society, to facilitate good research practice everywhere in the continent, to defend academic freedom and trustworthy science, to strengthen diversity and inclusiveness, and to think and act globally. Let me now conclude by referring to this evening's main event, the award of the Madame de Staal Prize to Professor Mariana Mazzucato of University College London. Academy fellows are uh, not the only ones to produce great intellectual works in Europe. Alea Madame de Staal Prize was created to honor a scientist or scholar whose work has contributed to a deeper understanding of European identity and culture. And I think we all know that European identity and culture is EU, but also those countries on our continent that contribute to the progress of science without being in the EU. Laureates are chosen regardless of their background and assessed solely on their academic merits. As such, we have seen laureates in the past coming from legal background as well as from cultural studies or the history of science. We are happy tonight to award this prize for the sixth year running, which also marks the third year of co-sponsorship by the Compagnia San Paolo, and we have the joy of hosting the president of the Compagnia San Paolo, Professor Profumo, with us tonight, who will also address us with a few words. I would also like to thank the prize jury over the past year for having identified such a prestigious scholar. The, uh, this year's laureate will be introduced in her work by uh, President Bourguignon, but uh, let me just stress the fact that she has truly been over the last years a global uh, intellectual and scholar, originally born in Rome, left her home state to pursue an academic career in the US and now in the United Kingdom, where she occupies herself with the economics of innovation and public value. The Madame de Staal Prize not only takes it, its name from Germaine de Staal, one of the strongest and most visible women of her time, but also the values she represented in terms of curiosity, enlightenment, and exchange of thought that she represented so well. And I must admit, I also do take a little Helvetic pride in knowing that the Chateau de Coppé on Lake Geneva, you observe that uh, Federal Councillor Parmelin described her as Genevoise, so was the place where she could seek refuge when the pressure of Napoleon and her other opponents became too much to handle. In contrast with Madame de Staal, who was competing with state powers, most notably Napoleon, Marianna Mazzucato has, has had it in a certain way better, as the powerful state actors are turning to her in dozens to be inspired by her ideas. To name just but one of her achievements that really stands out is her work as a special advisor, advisor on mission-driven science and innovation for Commissioner Moedas, a role in which she shapes the upcoming Commission's research framework program, Horizon Europe. So, if anyone in this audience, which I hope will think of writing their funding proposals uh, to be more mission-oriented, you will have her to blame, or if your, uh, so the request is rejected, you will have her email address uh, where to address your complaints. With this, I would like to thank you very much to you for your attention and hand over the floor to Monsieur Jean-Éric Paquet, Director General of Research of the European Commission. Thank you very much.
Dear Antonio, uh, Monsieur le Conseiller fédéral, uh, dear President Loima, dear Jean-Pierre, dear Mariana, uh, dear fellow uh, academies, uh, dear Academy fellows, guests and friends. It's a real pleasure uh, and also an honor to be here this evening and to celebrate with you the 25th anniversary of uh, ALEA, the European Academy umbrella for National Science Academies. 25 amazing and exciting years where Europe and science changed tremendously, but where science and Europe were also challenged deeply, and Alea was uh, a witness, but also a key actor of that remarkable period, and in many ways also part of these transformations. I full-heartedly want to share the many congr congratulation messages, uh, Antonio, which you received from Carlos Moedas, from Marisa Gabriel, uh, from my predecessor and friend uh, Robert Jan Smith, but also from Rolf Feuer, the chair of the Science Advisory Mechanism, and from Jean-Pierre. As you know, uh, or as many of you I, I think know, I've been Director General for Research now for a little bit more than a year, and I have met and, and visited uh, several of you. But although I have worked with Philippe Busquin as Research Commissioner, uh, I don't think I can claim that I'm a specialist of the world of science academy. So if you allow, I would like to give you more my personal and probably incomplete view on uh, what I have seen, learned, and learned to appreciate about ALEA. Dear Antonio, as Director General of RTD, you have been one of my very first guests, uh, and I could witness firsthand how engaged you and ALEA are in discussions about research in Europe and indeed about our framework program for research and innovation. ALEA has, ever since it was established, uh, continuously provided did useful, precious advice and guidance to the European Commission. I mean, some call it lobbying, but um, very useful advice on the different framework programs and on the European uh, research area. In just a couple of uh, minutes, um, Marianne, you will be awarded um, the Madame de Stal Prize. Uh, Marianne is our champion for uh, mission-oriented research. But in fact, ALEA, uh, Antonio, you, you didn't highlight it enough. You were one of the very early uh, supporters of the ideas of missions uh, in a statement devised together with several organizations entitled Living Together, Missions for Shaping the Future. Well, European research ministers and members of the European Parliament have heard you uh, and Mariana, and we will indeed now have um, EU research missions in, uh, in five areas under Horizon Europe, climate adaptation, clean cities, clean oceans, healthy soil, and cancer. So I'm also very much looking forward, and I would like to thank you both for this very uh, precious advice. In the same way that science needs to be conducted comprehensively and thoroughly, it also must be communicated to the public and uh, policymakers. And I must say, I'm particularly grateful and impressed by the commitment of ELEA and its fantastic work in support of the scientific advice mechanism. I'm only hosting it and supporting Rolf, Nicole, and uh, our chief scientific advisors in the SAM. And as consortium member of uh, SAPEA, uh, your, uh, your fellows have provided extremely precious uh, scientific advice. And you know that for the Commission, science-based and evidence-based policymaking is absolutely essential. We need to ensure that European uh, initiatives are best established, and uh, the work you are doing uh, with them uh, very much helps that process. I must say I'm also particularly glad, Nicole, to, to, to see that there will be tomorrow a SAPEA session on microplastics, your latest uh, contribution to the SAM work. Uh, which was, I think, here particularly um, uh, remarkable. And microplastics are, are really a science subject which is um, illustrative of the need to reconcile science with citizens because the, the concerns and uh, expectations of citizens are high, but the knowledge gaps are probably even higher. 
and science really needs to mobilize itself to help us get it right on plastics and on microplastics. Within the consortium, the SAPIA consortium, ALEA also leads on communication activities. Uh, and clearly, you have recognized the importance of not only doing and reviewing science, but also really engaging with the public. And I say, I cannot think for all of us in the room this evening of anything more important than engaging better and more with our citizens, with uh, pupils, students, but citizens across all ages, because our citizens today increasingly do not understand science anymore. You know it better than me. They don't always value it, but more problematic, they increasingly start to fear progress and science. And that is a development which is uh, particularly problematic because this in turn also limits the capacity of uh, our societies to invest in science and create the political space for disruptive science and innovation. So I think we need all of us uh, to continue to engage with our citizens and bring them on board that they see that we carry out the science which, which our societies need and that they can understand how we work on science with and for them. Uh, and your engagement with citizens in ALEA is, as said, quite striking. Um, and I, I would really encourage this to continue very much. The Madame de Stahl Prize is, I think, an, a very remarkable uh, illustration of that. And uh, Marianne, I'm sure we will use your prize today, and Alea will use your prize today to communicate mission-driven research, because that's, I think, one of the most effective ways to connect uh, back to citizens. And I will not say much uh, on the prize itself. President Profumo, you will speak about the prize in a, in a moment. Uh, but what you said, uh, Antonio, on European identity is indeed one of the remarkable features of your work and of the Madame de Stal Prize. The first one was awarded in 14 by a politician, uh, and not just any politician, but the president of the commission, Emmanuel Barroso, awarded Luisa Passerini to you uh, in 2014. And a year later, Carlos Moedas awarded the prize to Dame Helen Wallace, a political scientist of the Royal Society. And not only uh, that, but she was also one of my professors and mentors at the College of Europe. And indeed, I can very well understand uh, how uh, Helen uh, was um, um, selected and chosen for that prize. And what I find also truly remarkable with the prize is that you decided in your third edition to award it not to a scientist per se, but to the president of the European Court of Justice, Kuhn Lennartz. And this, I think, again shows how ALEA is uh, part also of uh, a Europeans, European policy uh, developments, which I find particularly important. I would like, uh, as, as one last uh, area, uh, to underline the remarkable work you are doing also with us on research integrity. This also uh, is an area which is key. Uh, in particular to ensure the trust uh, in science and in scientists. And I think every day we see around the world, but also in Europe, that, that understanding uh, the elements and the dilemmas of research integrity are a challenge for scientists everywhere. And your work will certainly help us. Already in 2011, together the, with, with the European Science Foundation, you developed the first European Code of Conduct for research integrity, which you revised in 2017. I hope you know that we are using this code um, in Horizon 2020. This is a, a reference code uh, for all our research grantees. And more than that, this uh, code has now made it into the legislation of Horizon Europe, where it is the explicit reference on this very important uh, uh, area. So it's, I think it's the first time that an academic work makes it into EU legislation. So well done and thank you very much for that. Allow me to finish by saying a, a few words also on Horizon Europe and on the work done um, in Brussels. I mentioned uh, missions already. The Commission, Carlos Moedas, presented the proposal, as you know, not even a year ago, a very ambitious proposal with a very ambitious 100 billion a budget for the next uh, period. But more remarkable even than the proposal is that ministers and members of the European Parliament were able in less than a year 
at the end of March to agree on the main architecture and the main ingredients and elements of Horizon Europe. Of course, what is still missing, and I think we need to be all well aware of that, is the budget that will come together uh, with the overall EU budget discussion. And I would expect that uh, many, maybe all of you in the room, uh, will agree that the Commission proposal is ambitious and a good starting point. I'm sure many of you will also agree that the European Parliament being 20% more ambitious than us at 120 million has a strong case. But I think what is more important now is that um, the discussion on the added value of that European research component, which interacts, complements, and structures what all of you are doing in your national system, is also seen as of the highest added values to your finance ministers and to your leaders. Because at the end of the day, it is um, those uh, prime ministers and presidents which will come to Brussels in the autumn. They will decide the overall European budget for the next period, and within that, they will then also agree on how much uh, research and innovation should be prioritized. I think the case is extremely strong. Your track record on the horizon 2020 and previous programs is outstanding. But at the same time, politicians are always confronted with uh, deeply conflicting and competing priorities. So I think we cannot be complacent. And I think the debate needs to take place at national level, in your national system, with your national politicians, administration, and leaders, so that when they come to Brussels, they can then see that investing in research and innovation and education with Erasmus is obviously something which is of a national priority and is to be done in your national system, but it is uh, complemented with extremely high added value by a very strong European program as well. So Horizon Europe, uh, Pascal Lamy told me when I started a year ago, I'm not sure I completely listened to him at the outset, that it's evolution not revolution. For a little while, I insisted that it was more revolution than evolution, and then I quickly realized that this was not a very good idea, and that uh, the scientific world also likes a little bit of continuity. So I think he was quite right in saying evolution not revolution, in particular, because in Horizon Europe, the key component or the, the key science component of the program is essentially carried over from Horizon 2020, and for very good reasons, because this is where the European Research Council is located with a much increased budget. But the re remarkable uh, work of the European Research Council, led by Jean-Pierre and his scientific council, has proven its worth both in terms of construct but also in terms of priorities, so we decided to roll it over. And I must say I'm very happy uh, to say that ministers and members of the European Parliament shared uh, that assessment. And so you can look at the next uh, phase of the European Research Council with, uh, with confidence that we will be able to continue to fund um, the best research, I would add, the best research in the world, uh, thanks to uh, Jean-Pierre and the Scientific Council. Similarly, for the Marie Skłodowska Curie fellowships, we are also rolling them over, and largely also for infrastructure. I mean, there are, however, uh, many uh, very important developments and changes. I'm not going to say much on missions, Mariana, because I'm sure you will also, uh, to an extent, cover Horizon Europe. But missions in Horizon Europe are going to be a, a particularly powerful way of connecting our citizens to research in the sense that we will, in the five areas which I noted earlier, we will work with mission boards to be appointed uh, shortly. Uh, expressions of interests, by the way, are still open. With these mission boards, we will not look just at the research which is relevant, but before looking at the research, we will try in broad consultation and consultation in Europe to identify what exactly we want the missions to deliver. It's about delivery. It's about delivery for citizens. It's about delivery in society. A professor in Leiden, when I recently visited, and we were discussing health research and the cancer mission, told me, uh, you're right, this is not about research per se, because I must admit, none of my scientific publications ever cured a patient. It was a drug. 
It was equipment, it was a doctor, it was a hospital, it was a health system. So the research mission aims at connecting in with a very concrete delivery the research effort we will do under Horizon Europe and I hope beyond Horizon Europe by asking or allowing or proposing to all of you to combine your efforts in a scientific and research agenda, but then also look at delivery and how public policies must change to ensure that delivery. So we've, we've heard you, I think, Mariana, but you will confirm it, I hope, later on. Submissions will be a very um, important uh, novel uh, way of uh, doing European research. The other change I would like to highlight is uh, the effort we are now doing to become much more cross-cutting across uh, sectors and research areas, in particular, of course, for societal challenges and industrial competitiveness. We have main clusters which are all cross-cutting, for example, climate, energy, and transport, for example, natural resources, environment, and food. But beyond these clusters on which we will work um, uh, to identify the cross-cutting priorities, we also will try to link up these main clusters so that the added value of European research is to genuinely complement what is happening at national level. Sector-driven research is very well known by member states. The added value we hope to provide is by linking up that research into these cross-cutting topics. This is a very different way of uh, approaching the framework program, and it has meant in the Commission that we are preparing Horizon Europe in co-creation across the European Commission Department. In Horizon Europe, no one owns a budget, so the segmentation of Horizon 2020 is not the way we will prepare and run Horizon Europe. Everyone is around the table, but no one owns his part of the research program. And the added value of that beyond the quality, which I hope it will generate, is also that around the table we have many more players in the Commission which previously had no budget, were not part of the conversation. So we have colleagues from the Directorate for Health, DG Santé, colleagues from the Climate part of the Commission. They are equally designing and co-creating Horizon Europe in the Commission. This, colleagues, this is a particularly challenging way uh, in the Commission, but equally challenging for the outside world. And this is why Carlos Moedas wants now, and using the time which the political early agreement now offers, wants to use the time ahead for a process of strategic planning where we'll, we will engage with all of you to finalize the co-design of these new cross-cutting priorities. Because we are well aware that all actors in Europe need to be well informed of the new approach and you need to own this new approach. But for you to own it, we also believe that you need to help us shape it and co-design it. So that's the next phase which now opens up in the strategic planning process as of the summer over the end of the year so that when the program is finally adopted, we have uh, identified together what these cross-cutting priorities should be. I will now not dwell on the European Innovation Council, uh, Antonio, even if I think for academies this is equally uh, a fascinating uh, new development under Horizon Europe with this capacity which I hope we will have to deeply change how disruptive innovation and scaling up is happening in Europe. And, some, and, and to an extent, uh, the ambition of the Commission and Carlos's personal ambition is that the EIC does what the European Research Council has done. The European Research Council tells the world, come to Europe where the best science can be done, and rather successfully. If the EIC is the same success, it will say in five years to innovators, maybe not come to Europe, but stay in Europe to do your innovation and scale up. And if we achieve that, then the EIC will have been a great success. Europe and, uh, and the world are, are confronted today with um, three main transitions, the ecological transition or climate transition, the economic uh, transition and the social one. And they need, they interact, they intersect, they have uh, links and uh, difficult trade-offs. And it's very clear for, for the Commission and my teams in DGRTD that dealing with these uh, transitions effectively or, or supporting the policies to deal with this transition will require 
deep science, new knowledge, research solutions. And this direction is uh, the one which I hope European research uh, will take with and around the framework program, but also uh, within the European uh, research area. And Antonio, you are a key player in the European research area. And so I very much hope that uh, Alea will, in the next 25 years, also uh, be a key player of that European science and um, research area. Uh, I'm very much expecting it, looking forward to it. And as I am in a university, I can finish by saying that for the next 25 years, the only wish I can say is keep it up. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, we now come to the award ceremony itself. The first uh, speaker is our partner in uh, awarding this prize, in supporting it and letting it come, which is the Compagnia San Paolo. Uh, the president of the Compagnia San Paolo is Professor Francesco Profumo, who is a former rector of the Polytechnical University of Turing and a former minister of the Italian Republic, I understand not of the current government. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir, please. Thank you, President. <clears throat> Distinguished colleagues, I'm honored to be here in Bern at the Swiss Academy of Arts and Sciences. And I would like to thank the President, uh, Professor Antonio Loprieno, for inviting me to the award ceremony of the Madame de Stahl Prize. Compagnia di San Paolo has been supporting the prize since 2017, and we are very honored to be part of a such prestigious initiative of ALEA especially in its celebration for the 25th anniversary. Compagnia di San Paolo, which I'm honored to chair, has been founded in 1563, 466 years ago, and a charitable brotherhood, and it's today one of the largest private law foundations in Europe. It pursues aims of public interest and social use in order to foster for civil, cultural, and economic development of the communities in which it operates. Compagnia is active in the sectors of research and health, art, cultural heritage and activities, cultural innovation, social policies, and philanthropy. Its member of the European Foundation Center, EFC, and ACRI, the Italian Association of Foundations of Banking Origin and Saving Banks. The All European Academy's Madame de Stahl Prize for Cultural Values was established and firstly awarded in the year 2014 to promote and enhance the intellectual and cultural richness of Europe that comes from its inherent diversity and plurality and foster the European integration process. The prize indeed highlights how outstanding scholarly work, particularly in the field of the humanities and the social sciences, contributes to the understanding of Europe as a cultural and intellectual entity. This initiative raised awareness to the importance of the European cultural values, especially 
in a moment when cultural diversity is meant as a treat. Strain is growing and trust is declining. The prize aims at promoting and strengthening an understanding of Europe as complex but multifaceted, intellectual, open, and dynamic. We are glad that this year the prize is award awarded to Professor Mariana Mazzucato, a great economist that devoted her career and her outstanding work to innovation and its relationship with the role of the public policy and how to steer innovation in mission-oriented ways directed at the Sustainable Development Goals. Professor Mazzucato will be more widely introduced by Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon later on. I just want to remark that her inspiring work has been also a reference point for our activities in the field of research and innovation. I would briefly address to you the commitment of the Compagnia di San Paolo in this great initiative. The foundation is engaged in supporting innovation and it, in, in its several aspects, from the technological side to the social and cultural one. And it is actually the cultural environment through the, its connection with the humanities science and technology and economy that can give a great contribution to innovation and have a strong impact on the society. In this effort to promote the relationships between scientific knowledge and its impact on society, Compagnia di San Paolo wish to widen the concept of dissemination of culture and knowledge transferred to citizens. In particular, in this field, Compagnia has set up actions to intercept new entities, to develop innovative formats dedicated to the relationships between science and society. This is in light of the European reflection on the subject, open science, and the priorities emerging from the current public debate in terms of the spread of scientific knowledge and gender participation in the educational path and the scientific professions. I hope that this prize will continue to enhance eminent researchers and intellectuals whose work represent a significant contribution to the identity and values of Europe. And I wish to thank Alea for its great efforts in keeping all the European academics connected in supporting in their mission of contributing to scientific progress and the spreading knowledge. I'm concluding this short speech by expressing again how much Compagnia di San Paolo is proud to support the Madame de Stahl Prize, congratulating Professor Mazzucato for her nomination and thanking again Professor uh, Lo Pietro and Alea for inviting me today to this award ceremony. Thank you. When we decide to award a prize to a distinguished scholar, one of the parallel decisions uh, is whom should we ask to introduce the scholar? So the laudatory speech is also an important component of the ceremony itself. And it is a particular privilege for us as Alea that the president of the European Research Council, himself one of the foremost 
scientists on our continent, Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon accepted our invitation to be the laudatory speaker for tonight. It was mentioned by Director General Paquet, ERC has become, to a certain extent, a synonym with a scientific quality at the highest level, at the highest global level. This is one of the European success stories, to a large extent, due also to the quality of its presidency. So thank you very much, Professor Bourignon, for being with us. Thank you very much for these kind words. Monsieur le Conseiller Federal, the Alia President, Professor Antonio Loprieno, Monsieur le Director General, Sir Jean Eric, dear Mariana Mazzucato, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends. It's indeed a great privilege for me to give the laudatio for Professor Mariana Mazzucato, recipient of the 2019 Madame de Stal Prize for Cultural Values. First, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the ALIA for having chosen its prize, for its prize, the remarkable figure of Germaine de Stal Holstein, one of the few women of her time with a European-wide impact due to her literary work and personal brilliance. One of her major contributions was to make the cultural values present in different countries of Europe more tangible at the turning point of Europe's history in the context of a rapidly changing political landscape. Think of the trajectory of France, from the Ancien Regime to the French Revolution, from the Napoleonian domination to the Restoration, if bringing up such a narrow vision is acceptable here. These agitated times and the repeated expression of her outspoken views forced her to find refuge a few times, as was mentioned in her family castle in Copé, in the Canton de Vaud, not far from here. Therefore, it is not surprising to find in Corinne ou l'Italie, one of her masterpieces published in 1807, the following statement. Nous vivons seuls, nous vivons dans un siècle où l'intérêt personnel semble le seul principe de toutes les actions des hommes. Et quelle sympathie, quelle émotion, quel enthousiasme pourrait jamais résulter de l'intérêt personnel. Il est plus doux de rêver de à ces jours de dévouement, de sacrifice et d'héroïsme qui pourtant ont existé et dont la terre porte encore de, des honorables traces. I'm sure you see how much Madame de Stahl's words resonate with the times we live in. I would like to suggest that the resonance be extended to Madame de Stahl's personality and that of the 2019 recipient, Mariana Mazzucato. I'm led to this by the words of the Alia president himself, Professor Antonio Loprieno, who chaired the jury for the prize. Here is a quote from him. Mariana Mazzucato is a brilliant and provocative economist who has challenged stories of value creation, innovation, and growth. In an ingenious way, she has been able to create new economic narratives to understand contemporary realities in Europe and beyond. Indeed, Mariana Mazzucato defines her work as focused on the relation between, I'm quoting, focused on the relation between innovation and the direction of growth with emphasis on building symbiotic parent partnerships that can create a form of growth that is more innovation-led, inclusive, and sustainable. As a mathematician, that is someone who necessarily has to give a lot of attention to the definition of the words and how they are used, I'm sen very sensitive to a critical stand on the misconceptions of markets, which has led to wrong conclusions on appropriate measures to be taken to sustain them. Another example is the over emphasis of the role of entrepreneurs taken in isolation, when in her work she stresses the critical importance of an entrepreneurial ecosystem. As a result, she demanded a very significant reappraisal of the role of the state in the process of technological innovation. For her, the entrepreneur who takes risks and explores unknown technological territories has always been the government. There is no in radical innovation in which the state has not played a, a leading role, although as an inventor, creator of markets, and even firms. 
For me, these contributions of hers, and she never misses an opportunity to raise the issue in her public interventions, are significant in the context of cultivating cultural values, as they forced all people who take the public debate seriously, there are still a few, to go beyond decorum, which is precisely what makes cultural values alive and relevant. Mariana describes her domain as disruptive economics. Others describe her as the world's scariest economist. She certainly bursts with intellectual and physical energy, all the characteristics that, of course, remind of those of the young Germaine de Stahl. They are helping her change traditional thinking as she has managed to bring and install inventive ideas into mainstream political economics. In her 2013 book, The Entrepreneurial State, she poses the right questions on current innovation policies. The state plays a central role in establishing the coherence between actors and innovation. This requires a long-term vision, patience, and means that private firms cannot, or in general do not want to mobilize in this area. Public action, public action is irrepressible. In her more recent book, The Value of Everything, Mariana exhorts those who will listen, I'm quoting, to take action to reform modern capitalism and to change the way value is currently understood. She explains how the key characteristics of innovation processes, uncertainty, collectiveness, and cumulativeness can be complementary or sometimes oppose, oppose each other. Governments play a powerful role in creating value. The state has been at the source of fundamental technologies such as the GPS, developed further with commercial purposes by the private sector. She convinced us that the state should stop being viewed necessarily as an unproductive sector, that governments should become active value creators rather than just facilitators of the real economy or savers during crisis, of course with due checks. Here again, she's having an issue with the present use of the keyword value, so often misused, when not forgotten nowadays, especially in the European context. In her messages, both written and oral, there is no shortage of criticism for neither governments, nor the private sector, nor mainstream economic teaching. She's comfortable being a disruptor, but she's at the same time a bridge builder. Early in her career, Mariana Mazzucato fast emerged as an original thinker in political economy. She studied stock market and market share volatility in depth in some specific industrial sectors, such as the automobile industry, the personal computer industry, and the pharmaceutical sector. One of her central concerns was the impact of technological innovation in the development of the industry in relation to the strategies followed. Mariana has the ambition to create a new economic policy framework to guide public investments in tackling societal challenges. We can only praise her for that. Europe, in particular, seriously needs such a framework. Here I'm quoting her, quote, many countries across the globe are pursuing growth policies that seek to be smarter, more inclusive, and more sustainable. My intervention will argue that the types of long-run strategic investments which such growth requires means public policy must be justified, nurtured, and evaluated in a different way. Instead of policies being motivated purely in terms of fixing market failures and or system failures, policies can be justified and measured in terms of their ability to create and shape markets with markets as outcomes of the interaction between public, private, and third sector actors." End of quote. Through academic work, and more recently even more through her books, embracing broad, broad areas in which she analyzes key dysfunctions, she has created the conditions for making her voice heard in the public arena. This has led her to be sought after as contributed to the definition of public policies in various environments, from banking tools to social programs, from sustainable development goals to the research programs. From the UK to the US, from Latin America to the United Nations, participating in the World Economic Forum Global Future Council, and of course, to the European Union in different roles. First, as member of the European Commission Expert Group on Economic and Societal Impact of Research and Innovation, and of course, more recently, 
a special advisor for mission-driven science and innovation. Commissioner Carlos Moidas, who appointed her for this last engagement, said, I'm quoting, I believe that in innovation and research, the role of the member states and the union is essential. It is a very good example where the role of the public sector should not only be to tackle a market failure, but also to set directions. As you noted, I'm sure this is fully in line with Mariana's fundamental analysis. In an interview, Mariana said that probably the highest impact document she will ever write is the strategy paper published last year, in which she calls for mission-oriented EU research and innovation as part of the next EU framework program, Horizon Europe. In it, she develops her claim that correcting market failures means putting patches on a market that already exists, while states have actually a much more crucial role in dynamically creating and shaping new markets. For her, this is the only way to successfully solve the great challenges that our societies are facing. It is critical to note that in this document, she clearly states, I'm quoting, that this is not about prescribing specific technology, but providing directions of change around which bottom-up solution can then experiment. Missions are not about prioritizing innovation and applied research over the frontier research funded by instruments like the European Research Council, end of quote. Elsewhere in the document, she says more about how the various components of Horizon Europe will contribute to a common goal. I'm quoting again. Under a given mission, it will be possible both to identify some of the most advanced, relevant scientific projects funded by the European Research Council and mobilize them to contribute to a mission and at the same time to use the future European Innovation Council to look into what the most advanced start startups are doing and how they can support a given mission. Thus, missions will be a way to combine different and diverse inputs into a more creative, ambitious, and effective result. You heard Director General Paquet explain this was the spirit of the next Horizon Europe. I must say that Mariana's contribution to how Europe can approach innovation-led growth is a refreshing shift away from industrial policies aimed at picking just the winners, and faces on the part that public policy and public funding should play in stimulating and, in the end, generating those transformative technologies and solutions that will bring us to markets that do not exist yet. She underlines that to attain this goal requires systemic long-term public policies that draw on frontier knowledge a permanently rejuvenating territory. This is a good place to remind us, us all that funding bottom-up curiosity-driven research is just crucial for this frontier to remain a frontier and not something that used to be one. It is therefore essential to prevent the focus on missions, making the political echelon comfortable to forget about the importance of challenging researchers so that they feel welcome to follow their own curiosity. This is a fundamental task of the entrepreneurial state whose critical role Mariana pointed to. No new markets can be created without it. Indeed, this also gives a very strong message to those who could be tempted to see Horizon Europe as a way to please various clients and lobbies. We are talking here about building a policy where the whole panoply of policy tools is mobilized and articulated, top-down, bottom-up, cooperative, disruptive, cluster-like, etc. Mariana's impact on public policies is extraordinary. The reactions to her book are impressive and contribute greatly to renovating and enriching the public discourse on the research innovation debate, a much needed action. The award she is receiving today is, of course, one among many. But I hope that by linking her to Germaine de Stahl and to the ALIA, all European academies, she feels that it brings a special dimension to her work. ALIA writes about Germaine de Stahl. Celebrated for her conversational eloquence, she participated actively in the political and intellectual life of her times. I hope I've convinced you that the same can be said about Professor Mariana Mazzucato, whose active participation in the European policymaking and academic circle is highly visible and will continue to be highly visible for the years to come. Mariana, please allow me to express my personal congratulations on this celebratory occasion of you receiving the Madame de Salle Prize. Thank you.
we are now in the performative act itself and to convey the prize we have asked our federal council to perform this action. Thank you very much. Merci, Madame Professeur. Aujourd'hui, mesdames et messieurs, nous sommes le 8 mai. 74 years ago, it was the end of the Second World War, the beginning of the peace. It's a big symbol, and I'm proud to give you the prize. Congratulations. All the best for the future. Thank you. Tout le bon pour le futur. Félicitations. Well, now, no prize without acceptance of the prize, so now we want to see, first of all, whether Professor Matucado accepts the prize, and second, whether she deserved it at all. So we want to hear something from her. Thank you. Okay. Should I give some... I wanted to do a, a big group hug, but, but uh, the men were not uh, accepting of it. There are too many men, not enough women on stage. So, so first of all, thank you so much, Jean-Pierre, for that wonderful introduction. Antonio for, I don't know, having lobbied to have given me the prize. I'm not sure how the decision was made. To the Swiss Academy of Sciences, and of course, Alea, and all of you for being here. Um, I think what I'd like to do in the time I have, in fact, I'll put my timer, is to also make us feel a bit uncomfortable, precisely because, you know, we all heard from the speakers today, and I'm sure in the conference that you'll be having over the next days, that things are not so good. <laughs> so we need to be wary when new concepts come up, whether it's the entrepreneurial state, whether it's globalization, whether it's missions that we don't just replace the existing status quo with sexy words that sound great, but they almost just give us an excuse for not really making change and actually bringing the same people to the table to continue talking about uh, things. So I think this, you know, for me, it, it's such an honor to receive this prize in the name of Madame de Stal, who of course was so oppositional. She wanted to contest the status quo. She wanted to contest even those who called themselves revolutionaries like Napoleon. And so bringing back values, but also value and how it is co-created and co-shaped and by who, who's at the table, even framing, for example, the missions or even the concept of a green transition, who's at the table really negotiating that, discussing it, what are the words that are being used? What are the contracts in place? I really think this is an opportunity to contest all those different aspects. In Europe, of course, being in a moment of crisis, as we heard, both social, political, economic, but also having such a rich history of solidarity between countries, of bringing us the, the wonderful innovation, the biggest social innovation, which was the welfare state, <laughs> which really brought rights. You know, everyone talks about universal basic income, but the welfare state was universal basic services, not a bad idea. Um, it's such a great place to rethink, to really rethink things and make sure that we're doing it in a serious way, which also, you know, with checks and balances in the process itself. Uh, not just in what we're talking about in terms of what we're trying to achieve. And, you know, I, I was very appreciative, of course, that Jean-Pierre mentioned um, and quoted so much, I feel like I have little to say now, of this notion that we really have to question the vocabulary that's being used. So there's so much talk, you know, in the innovation world about ecosystems of innovation, partnerships, public-private partnerships. But if you speak to any biologist, and I bet there's quite a few perhaps in the room, they will question you to already stop. You know, sorry, what are you talking about, ecosystem? What kind of ecosystem? Predator-prey, symbiotic, mutualistic, what kind? 
And we, at least in the social sciences, perhaps sometimes are lazy with those kinds of words, or actually maybe in, in some cases more rigorous, especially if we bring the legal dimension, the institutional dimension, the social dimension to those words. But in the innovation community, in the science and technology community, personally, I think we've become very lazy when we talk about these words. We need to redefine the partnerships. We need to redefine how public and private come together, not just in terms of the contracts, but again, as I said, the vocabulary and, and really questioning who's at the table. And for this, you know, it, it's quite important to question, again, how we talk about the economy, and I'm an economist. So again, Jean-Pierre mentioned that, you know, I, 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 like others, have questioned the word the market. What is the market? Is the market the same thing as the private sector? We often hear the market versus the state. No. The market itself is an outcome, it's an outcome of how public and private and third sector, so civil society organizations, come together, but also individually how they are governed. We shouldn't forget, by the way, that the modern day markets were fundamentally shaped also by social movements. Without trade unions, labor unions, the labor movement, we would not have the weekend not a bad social innovation, the eight-hour workday. <laughs> um, and those struggles and those movements, not just in, with trade unions, help to form, to shape, to co-create the modern-day market. But of course, also public policy, and that's you know, a lot of the work that I've done over the years, is, has been to show how policy itself um, you know, really kind of uh, ha has been fundamental to getting us the kind of markets we have, which isn't always good, we know, in fact, right? The financial crisis, of course, shows us what market mechanisms can often uh, uh, bring, which is, you know, periodic crises. But questioning the market and how we use the word means also uh, creating less of a lazy narrative in those who also use, for example, the term market forces as an excuse for why, for example, perhaps they are implementing short-termist and speculative uh, policies. As soon as you say, what market forces? They're not out there as some deterministic force, but how you yourself, for example, in a company govern, do corporate governance itself determines the kind of market outcomes we want. And so in rethinking the market, in rethinking the kind of tools we also need in Europe today to really get to these wonderful challenges that we talk about, which Europe has actually been talking about for many years, the challenge of sustainable growth, inclusive growth, smart innovation-led growth, that is really a frank and explicit uh, admission that growth and innovation have not, have not just a rate but a direction. But how do we set that di direction together in a way that also enables contestation along the way and not just a top-down process it is, I think, a very important uh, uh, part of this discussion. But let me just come back to this word governance. You know, it's not just corporate governance that's important, it's also governance of the public sector. You know, when we think of innovation spending and science and technology spending, education spending, all sorts of spending by the public sector, this happens through different types of organizations. My work in the entrepreneurial state looked at the different organizations that were important for getting us basically everything that's smart and not stupid inside all our smart products from the internet, GPS, touchscreen display, Siri, et cetera. But what do we know about those organizations? What do we know about CERN? What do we know about DARPA and its ability to really welcome exploration, experimentation, trial and error and error and error? Uh, what do we know about InQtel, uh, the CIA's public venture capital fund? You, you, you might get, uh, start getting scared when you realize just how powerful the CIA is. It even funded touchscreen display on all our phones. Every time you let your kids touch your phone, ask yourself who funded that. Um, but those organizations, it, it's, it's quite extraordinary. We have business schools around the world, you know, top business schools that think about really interesting issues about governance in the private sector. Just think of the courses that managers like Francesco Profumo would have taken, strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior. There are these wonderful textbooks that come out with these titles like Rejuvenating the Mature Corporation. Why? Because when you have a mature, large, bureaucratic, private company, you start worrying, is it going to you know, remain flexible and adaptable and dynamic and innovative and creative? Well, we need to be careful. So General Motors introduced the multi-divisional form of the company precisely to resist uh, big kind of bureaucratic structures. And yet, when we think of the 
public sector, the word bureaucracy, we have sort of just accepted it as a negative word, right? Instead of questioning how can we make sure we are constantly creating dynamic, creative, sexy uh, you know, bureaucracies that are nimble, flexible, adaptable, able to partner in dynamic ways with different actors in society, we just use the word, oh, that's such a bureaucratic procedure as though there's something in the DNA of a bureaucracy which will by definition make it more kind of you know, slow and inertial and, and lumpy and dinosaurish. And so you know, one of the things that we're doing in the institute that I set up at UCL, the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, has been very much to sort of question that and to create what we hope to be the kind of before and after moment for the masters in public administration, which really brings that live thinking about creating adaptable, flexible, uh, value-creating uh, public organizations and actually train the civil service with an idea that they are actually co-creating value. They're not just there to facilitate, to enable, to de-risk, a word which I'm sure many of us have written if, if we ever contributed to any white paper or green paper. You're de-risking who? The risk takers. If you're a young graduate, do you want to be a de-risker or a risk taker? We, we kind of set up our bureaucracies to fail. We don't describe them in ambitious ways which then also will attract some of the uh, you know, more ambitious, if you want, uh, uh, young people. So you know, this is a huge problem. And Obama mentioned it once. He had a wonderful quote. He said, you know, we're living in the digital age, but we still have structures, structures in government which are reminiscent of the age of black and white TV. But in order to make those changes, you really need to believe <laughs> in the role of the public. You need to believe that it can co-create value because then you will start asking yourself, are the right structures in place to enable it to be a co-creator as opposed to just a fixer of market or system failures? Um, and that's where I think we should kind of nest this whole concept of missions. Missions should be disrupting fundamentally, not just how we do policy, but how we do organizations, how we organize our instruments of intervention. And the word intervention itself, by the way, is one I don't like because, again, it's reminiscent of the fact you have something out there and you are intervening in it for good or for bad. Yeah? Um, so how do you really disrupt that? And, um, and there, you know, because it is the 50th anniversary of the moonshot, which was alluded to before, it's, it's a really interesting moment to just kind of pause. And instead of just using the word, the moon shock, we went to the moon and back again, amazing feat of humanity. And I know I think tomorrow in your sessions you will be reflecting on that, to really ask, do we have the structures in place, let alone the ambition you know, to go to the moon and, and to be so you know, challenge-oriented, mission-oriented, do we actually have the structures in place in the public sector, but also the public-private relationships that got us to the moon? And I think the answer is no. Um, but I think what's wonderful is given that this concept of missions and challenge-oriented innovation are, are really at the fore, not just in Europe, but also it's really taking off, I think, also in places like the UN, but also, as Jean-Pierre mentioned, we've been working on this also with rethinking financial institutions like public banks. How can they be not just handout machines to the businesses or sectors that, you know, that, that uh, yell the loudest for finance? How can they provide patient, long-term, committed finance to those organizations willing, willing to do what? To engage with the public sector in actually achieving really important societal goals. So let me just pause a minute and just reflect, kind of superficially, because of the time at disposal, on just what the moonshot meant. And firstly, yes, it was really inspirational, and I really welcome you, given the 50th anniversary, to look back at uh, Kennedy's speech, because he's kind of like, it's going to cost us a lot of money. You know, he doesn't use the word the deficit, but yes, it's going to go up. <laughs> um, but it's okay, because it really matters. It's going to help us, if we structure this properly, to create long-run growth, because science and technology have been critical for fueling long-term uh, growth creation. Um, and also what happens along the way is just as important as achieving it. You know, he really looked at, when he was looking also at some historical uh, examples, just how important actually setting up these dynamic structures were just as important actually getting to the moon. But first of all, in that case, it really was kind of Kennedy and his guys, right? It was pretty top down. 
And so the first question is, what do we mean by missions today when we're using this in Europe? Who's deciding? Is it the kind of Kennedy top-down, or is it something more like, say, what's happened recently in Germany? It's not a perfect policy, but the Energiewende policy, which you could argue has been kind of a national mission to reduce the carbon footprint of the country, but the, 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 how do you say, the legitimacy of that mission, forget, by the way, if it was perfect or not, we all know there's problems uh, with many of these policies, but the legitimacy of bringing that mission to the fore was an outcome of decades of the green movement. And the ability of a politician to harness, to capture, to be in discussion, to empathize, also in terms of the art of listening, with, again, social movements to then formulate missions is, again, something I'm not sure we have the capability to do. So let's think about it. What does Empathy 101 uh, look like in terms of this ability of co-creation? But secondly, it really was a mission that required lots of different sectors. Of course, NASA and you know, the aeronautics element, we know that bit. But it required also, in terms, again, of, of um, Jean-Larique's points, lots of different sectors, including nutrition, you couldn't just eat a hamburger, uh, you know, uh, uh, textiles and materials. And so this point of these modern missions today that we're thinking about in Europe and again around the world, that they should be intersectoral through, you know, lots of different sectors, interactor, public, private, third sector, interdisciplinary as academics, inter disciplinary, bringing the humanities, the poets, uh, to the table to really formulate these missions in such a way that are is, as inspirational as can be, is really, really important. And especially moving away from a sectoral policy, if you look at how, how many countries continue to have sector-based uh, kind of industrial strategies, what does a mission-oriented approach look like at the national level where you actually formulate missions around the future of mobility, clean growth, aging, that really get all your sectors the opportunity to collaborate in new ways and to really create additionality, making things happen that wouldn't have happened anyway. And there too, I think it's interesting with the Energiewende, it required even the steel industry to reduce its material content. You know, this wasn't just about renewable energy. But third, and, and, and this is perhaps the, the most difficult bit in terms of changing the status quo, you know, the moonshot required really using the power, the full power of government's tentacles in the system from procurement policy to prize schemes to grants, and I'm thinking also of more modern uh, missions that we've seen since the moonshot, to fulfill a goal. So instead of just having SME policy, small medium enterprise policy, as though firm size matters, um, instead of thinking of it in terms of, you know, who's gonna produce the lowest cost solution <clears throat> to some problem that the government has, really being able to rediscover and reignite the power of government purchasing, not just government investments on the supply side, but even the purchasing power of government to really fuel the bottom-up experimentation and exploration. So the multiple solutions that might get us, you know, to the moon, there was many different projects of which, by the way, many failed, <laughs> right? So again, I, I wasn't joking when I said trial and error and error and error. And back in 2014, I organized a conference called Mission Oriented uh, Finance and Innovation, I can't remember what it's called, and I invited about 30 different leaders of mission oriented organizations from around the world. And one was Cheryl Martin, who was the second director of ARPA-E, which is an equivalent organization of DARPA, but in the, in the Department of Energy, which with a much lower budget, but in theory similar, <coughs> sister organization. And I asked her, you know, how do you actually organize your organization? How do you organize RP? You know, what do you tell your, the civil servants who are working inside it? What do you, you know, how do you nurture this experimentation exploration, which we know was so important in the case of the internet, in the DARPA case? And she said something that really has stuck with me. And, and I was just talking to her about this again a couple weeks ago. She said, we actually measure, we measure our success by how much risk we were willing to take and how much economy-wide impact our successes have. So that whole issue of running a public sector institution which actually evaluates itself, um, am I allowed to drink this? I assume it's for me. No one else has touched it. Um, by how much risk it was willing to take, but also how much economy-wide, so not just tinkering on the edges, its success has, 
is very interesting. So one of the things we've been doing, and George Dibb is here, who's been helping us with the industrial strategy and revising it around a mission-oriented lens in the UK, is precisely to ask that question, but even to the Treasury. It's the Treasury, in the end, that evaluates these organizations. What does it mean, for example, to let go of, let me just drink it quickly, mm. let go of some of these more static and linear tools that have been used, that continue to be used, to evaluate public organizations like cost-benefit analysis and net present value and which market failure did you fix and if you did something else, you're crowding out. Um, you know, really bringing kind of new tools uh, to the Treasury itself, to the ministries of finance. It once struck me, I actually looked, and I still haven't found it, I'm sure it exists, I hope it exists, because I just can't believe it doesn't, but in the case of the Concord plane, which is often used as the classic, you know, picking winners problem and failure because it's not flying, well, of course, for the private sector, it's a failure because it's not flying, and so it's a commercial uh, failure, but for the public sector that invested so much money in it, there's been no proper calculation of all the intersectoral investments and spillovers that that particular project, forget whether we like it or not, but we should evaluate it, that that project had. The spillovers across many different sectors. Um, no evaluation, and yet in the common parlance, it's, it's, it's used as a picking winners uh, and a failure. But this whole issue of evaluation really, really matters because otherwise we create a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we pretend, for example, that these organizations are just fixing markets and evaluate them in that way, that actually ends up creating the kind of incentive systems inside, literally at the human resource level, of what you know, bureaucrats think they're doing. And the BBC, for me, has always been a very interesting example because it is evaluated formally every so often because it's the citizens who fund it through the charter. The, t the television license, and so every time it's evaluated, the same thing happens. And luckily, just because everyone loves the BBC, it somehow survives, notwithstanding this incredibly static process. But what the BBC is often told is, it's okay to make documentaries about giraffes in Africa, it's okay to make um, you know, a, a high quality news, which I'm sure you all watch when you're lonely in your hotel rooms, but soap operas and talk shows, mm -mm, that's for business. And if you do that, you're going to crowd out business and commercial opportunities. And actually, the success of the BBC has been precisely that it didn't view itself in such a narrow way. Okay, this part of the market I can invest in, you know, documentaries and high quality news, and this bit is for business. It actually has had an internal debate about public value. How do we achieve public value uh, irrespective, literally, of the format, in the, in the television uh, words, you know, the format actually means something, but irrespective of what we're doing, the process through which we're achieving it uh, is, is trying to achieve this public value. So the kind of soap operas, uh, if you've seen, you know, EastEnders is very different from Dallas and Dynasty, and precisely because they were so cutting edge in thinking about that, they have actually actively co-created and pushed the frontiers of the soap opera market itself, which has then crowded in, welcomed in the private sector eventually to do the same. And this is really important, by the way, for science funding too. One of the examples I often give in my um, writings is the example of the National Institutes of Health in the US, which spend huge amounts of taxpayer money on pharmaceutical uh, research. And the kind of questions I've asked is, how can it be that then the prices you know, of the drugs do not reflect the billions? Recently, it was 35 billion, uh, just last year, I think. I'm actually giving a talk next, uh, sorry, on June 6th to the NIH, kind of getting them to think through some of the questions. But that's sort of, how do you say, an easier question to ask. You ask, all this public money going into pharmaceutical research and the prices are not reflecting that, or the direction of innovation is not reflecting that. But the real question is, why has the National Institute of Health, which has put so much money into that system, not been as ambitious as the BBC in some ways in what it is creating? It's almost all about drugs. It's what a, a colleague of mine calls the pharmaceuticalization of the health sector. Much, much less 
proper kind of hardcore rigorous research goes into diagnostics, surgical treatments, preventative care, healthy living, redefining lifestyles, healthy lifestyles. So really what the role of a public sector organization I think is in this space of co-creating value and co-creating markets is to constantly really be pushing the frontier, being ambitious, and also then having the metrics to evaluate, have you actually been ambitious enough, as Cheryl Martin argued. Um, let me just finish just to say that I really think this concept of missions should be a collective source of discomfort. Okay, if we, you know, so many stupid things get done in the name of innovation. Some of the most regressive things have been done in the name of innovation. Capital gains tax fell by 50% in four years, lobbied for by particular actors who were at the time describing themselves as very important in innovation. The patent box, one of the silliest policies ever because it reduces the taxation on profits which have been generated by a 20 year monopoly. Yeah, it makes no sense. You've already taken care of you know, the incentive problem by giving someone a 20-year monopoly profit. You don't have to reduce the tax. Was lobbied for in the name of innovation. And we just have to be careful, again, who's at the table? How are we really co-creating these missions in a way that's not top-down, really thinking through the massive changes we need to make inside public and private organizations. Private organizations, which will no doubt benefit massively also from these new schemes, need to change. We have a record level hoarding rate in Europe, two trillion euros being hoarded. We have a record level financialization in the private sector. So three trillion dollars have been used just to buy back shares to boost share prices, stock options, and executive pay in the Fortune 500 companies in the last 10 years. What might missions mean for rethinking relationships between public and private? And, and, and here it's a really interesting lesson is Bell Labs. Bell Labs, one of the most innovative private sector R&D labs, came about in an era where government was much more confident and when it was giving AT&T its, its monopoly status, it, it was in exchange for reinvesting your profits back into the real economy, back into innovation, and big innovation beyond telecoms. So again, what might we learn from that? I was interested when Fiat, when uh, Sergio Marchione went to America, Obama in this rare moment of confidence when, when, when Fiat was buying Chrysler said, okay, but in this country, given that Chrysler was bailed out by the US government, so it was basically in public hands, in this country you're gonna invest in hybrid technology, hybrid engines, because they saw that actually Fiat wasn't doing that in Italy. And Marchione said, all right, <laughs> that was part of the deal. So instead of just thinking of missions in terms of a new deal, a green new deal, or a new deal around data, a new deal around climate, literally let's think through the deal. How can we create these more interesting, symbiotic, mutualistic, interesting partnerships? And here, Europe has so much to teach us. We have experiments around Europe, in Scandinavia, but also in the Basque region of Spain, of stakeholder governance, not just shareholder governance. Let's use that. Let's use those as experiments to really help us get the right processes in place. And I'm completely out of time, but I just want to say that it's such a positive agenda, both in terms of the direction of innovation, but really seeing it through in terms of the governance processes, not just of innovation, but of capitalism. I think it's fantastic, and it's what really will set Europe apart from what's currently happening in America and in China. So how great that we can do it together, and how great that you've given me this time in the honor uh, of Madame de Stal, who was, uh, how do you say, a disruptor. So, thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, with this musical closing, as the word says, we are going to close today's um, celebration, both of our 25th anniversary and of the Madame de Stahl Prize. I would like to thank, first of all, the laureate and con congratulate her once again to thank her for the thoughtful words that she addressed us in her acceptance speech. I would like to thank all the participants who contributed with their knowledge and with their presence. I would like to thank especially also the teams that are behind the organization of this event, University of Bern as our host, but also my colleagues, both in the Secretariat of ALEA and in the General Secretariat of the Academies of Science and Arts of Switzerland for having performed really a magnificent job. Thank you very much. May I invite then you to share with us a glass of water here and there with some drops of wine if your religious convictions allow that with us. Thank you very much.